Hey y'all, welcome to New Orleans. It's Andrew with Free Tours by Foot. And today I want to take you around a subject that has been lurking in the background through all of our French Quarter videos, but not something that we've given the full attention it deserves yet. And that is the buildings throughout the neighborhood. One of the things people love about the French Quarter is that when you get here, you kind of instantly know that you're not in a typical American city. And even from right where we are, you can see our much more typical American downtown right over in the distance. The buildings, even if you're not necessarily a big building watcher, are a big part of what tells that story when you get here. And for people who know what to look for, they also tell a lot of other stories besides. So what I want to share with you today is how to figure out what you're looking at, maybe infer some of the stories of the people who build stuff, the time in which it was built. And we're gonna do that using four basic types of buildings that are common here in different phases of history. So from the early days when we were French, we're gonna show you French colonial houses. There's gonna also be Creole cottages, which date from the time when we were run by Spain. And then we're gonna see Creole townhouses, which cover the kind of transition from French and Spanish to American ownership. And then finally, firmly in the era of American ownership, we're gonna see some shotgun houses. And all of this stuff is gonna be, if you ever wanted to see it in person, within a block of the intersection of Royal and Dumain Streets. And most significant of the houses that we're gonna see is this guy right across the street. This is your rare example of French colonial style in New Orleans today. You might expect in a neighborhood called the French Quarter that you'd see a lot of French design, and it is not the case, especially with our early styles of French design. There are virtually none of these left in the city at this point. So this is a house called Madame John's Legacy. We actually covered it in a previous video, so if you want to get a sense of where that name comes from or learn its film resume, then you can check out our French Quarter Film TV and Book Locations video. But for our purposes, it's one of these preserved relics of a bygone time when France ran the city between its founding in 1718 and its handoff to Spain in 1763. So French colonial houses wouldn't all have looked like this. This one is larger and it's also got this ground floor elevation that not all of them would have had. And you could actually explore this on the inside if you wanted because it's preserved as a museum. You could check out the Madame John's Legacy page on the Louisiana State Museum website if you want to keep up with how it's doing. It's under some renovation right now, hence the fence across the street. But eventually it's going to reopen and you'd be able to step inside. You'd be going through one of these sets of doors on the bottom, and then you'd be going up some stairs to get to the second level, which is originally the residential area. So looking at this, we could easily think of that upper area as the second floor, but for a lot of reasons, it was a good idea to boost the space you mainly lived in up above ground level. One of those was flooding. We're a very watery city. The French Quarter is right next to the Mississippi River, and back in the early days, it regularly broke its banks. And if you lived above the floodplain, yeah, your property was still going to get inundated, but at least your more fragile possessions would be up above where the water was going to go. And then after the flood season comes the hot season, during which time, given that warm air rises, it could do you a lot of good to move from the upstairs to the downstairs, which had an identical floor plan. The rest of the time, you could rent out that bottom space to a business, use it for storage, so it was flexible and useful in a lot of different ways. The problem these were not great for was fire, which became a really big thing in the late 1700s. In 1788 and 1794, we had a couple of huge fires which decimated the existence of these buildings. And the fire actually cut across this block, so it partly, if not completely, destroyed this building, and it was built back afterwards. By and large, after the first fire in 1788, the city was rebuilt again the same way, because the rebuild was left to residents to decide how to do, and they went with what they already knew how to do. Whereas after a second fire in such a short span of time, there was more of a top-down approach. And given that by then we were run by Spain, the Spanish crown was who decided what that top-down approach was going to look like. So Spanish royalty offered for many of the people who lived in New Orleans some financial support for rebuilding their house. But it had to be done to certain specifications. And that led to a total transformation of what the neighborhood looked like. So it gives us what today we call Creole cottages, which are these guys. 
So superficially, Creole cottages look pretty different from French colonial style houses, and it definitely represents a big shift in the aesthetic of the neighborhood. But basically, it's the ground floor of a house like Madame John's Legacy turned into a whole home on its own. You have the same four sets of shutters, generally windows in the middle, doors on the outside, and you have the same material structure. On the inside, it's framed up with cypress timbers. Between those posts, you have either bricks or this stuff called bousillage, which is a mixture of this clay-heavy mud we have in Louisiana and a whole lot of Spanish moss, the gray stuff that hangs from trees. And then over the outside, a layer of stucco, like you see here, and usually some pretty bright colors. What a trait that this has that was required back then that a lot of Creole cottages don't have today is you can see up top this kind of scallop-shaped detail. And what that is is a low wall surrounding a flat roof. The Spanish crown ordained flat roofs on these buildings, and we are in an extremely rainy climate, so this wasn't a great idea. So the Spanish weren't introducing something completely new. They were just taking what had worked in other colonies and put it here. Same stuff that you'd see in Cuba and Puerto Rico at that time. Same for French colonial houses. They were a mashup of French villages, West African villages, and the work of Arawak Native Americans of the Caribbean, and they were all throughout the Caribbean islands. So when you look at a house like this, you're looking at a rare relic. Actually, as far as I know, this is the only one that still has that old flat roof arrangement. And it was probably pretty cool in its day. You would have had a rooftop patio, and there used to be three of this house in a row, which would have allowed you, if you liked your neighbors, to just climb up on your little parapet and jump to your neighbor's house and go see them on their rooftop. But given the heavy rainfall that we have here, these houses have not stayed around. And so what you tend to see these days is a really pitched roof on these and that adds that advantage of upstairs residential space protected from flood water back onto these houses again. So most Creole cottages are gonna look like that. We'll see a couple of those in a second. And they also hold on to another element of Spanish design, which is courtyards. So outdoor space was important for the folks who lived here in every period. And when French colonial was the design, everything was spaced a lot further apart. So you could have a garden, really a whole yard. You could have like a grove of citrus trees on your property. And there would be plenty of room for that within a fence that delineated your boundaries. So as the city got denser, you ended up with this Spanish tradition of courtyards coming in. And courtyards are outdoor spaces that are behind the building and which are almost invisible from the street. So you'd see them pretty much only by means of little gates. And if you live in the French Quarter, you use those gates as part of your arrival home. So you might have two keys on your key ring, open up a gate first, go through a little alley, and then actually enter your house via the back. And the space that you enter from, this little enclosed outdoor space, is a social space, it's a space to grow things if you want to, and they're also just beautiful. So if you ever explore the French Quarter and you're looking for green space, you gotta either look from above, you gotta get into these courtyards somehow. They are this whole other side of the neighborhood that's really easy to miss and that are really kind of the last frontier of privacy in what's today a really, really social neighborhood. So courtyards also extend into, and all these Spanish traces in general extend into, another building type, which is what we call a Creole townhouse. And we've got a couple of these on this side of the street. So we have a front view of a Creole townhouse over here and then a side view as we go over along the block. And the side view helps us see the courtyard space. So this building faces onto Charters Street over here. But back here, you can see the wall that bounds the courtyard. And then you can see separate from it, this smaller structure. And even though it doesn't look the same today, that's originally built to be part of the same property as the main structure over to the left of it. So this could be called a lot of things. Could just be an outbuilding, that's kind of the generic name for them, but we have other names for them depending on how they were used. A lot of times they were stables or carriage houses, in which case you'd see a much larger door on the bottom. Also, a lot of times they contained a kitchen on the ground floor, and then oftentimes upstairs, these were slave quarters. And given that at some points the city is majority enslaved, these, as small and innocuous as they are, are sometimes the main residential spaces. So while we say four different basic house types in the neighborhood, from the perspective of an awful lot of the residents of the quarter at certain points in history, this kind of was a fifth type unto itself that contained most of their lives. So these have changed a lot over time. As soon as right after the Civil War, these became servant quarters or sometimes they were somewhere that an older relative or the older kids in the family might live. 
and eventually they become nowadays really desirable real estate because they're back away from the street. And so they have this seclusion and quietude that in the originally much more upscale quarters close to the street can be really hard to come by. And so in a weird way, slave quarters are super sought after today. And that taps us into the ways that these things have changed over time. So it might be noticeable that most of what I'm pointing out is not the stuff that people tend to lock eyes onto first thing when you arrive in the neighborhood. The stuff we've looked at is relatively low key so far. And that's because we're focusing on stuff that reflects the early days. We're kind of proceeding through time. Mostly Creole cottages haven't been modified a terrible lot from the time in which they were built and they remained pretty austere. Whereas Creole townhouses, they're the most common type of building in the French Quarter. They were the most frequently built type of building in the French Quarter during the days when we transitioned into American power at the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And so they're where you see this gradual upscaling of ostentation. So like with the two across the street, right next to each other, you've got a really simple one on the left, which has a small balcony, just enough space to be able to come outside. And it's enclosed with this decorative, but pretty simple, what we call wrought iron versus right next door, you have more decorated entrances and windows. You have a much deeper outdoor space, this gallery that runs over the entire sidewalk, and you have the much more complex and ornamental cast iron. So those are some of the hints about the transition into our American period. So if you're enjoying the tour so far, go ahead and hit the like button and help others discover the video. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, subscribe to our channel. We have walks through the French Quarter and Garden District, videos about Mardi Gras, everything you need to know about New Orleans. Visit our website for more about our tours, our travel tips, and more. We also have virtual tours and channels that focus on DC, New York, London, and more. Look for free tours by foot wherever you travel. You can support your guide with virtual tips, links in the description, and let us know what else you want to see. Leave a comment below. Now, back to the tour. There's this kind of a difference of like lifestyle and philosophy between Creoles and Americans in a lot of ways. Uh, Creoles were old money if they were money at all. And so they tended to think in terms of ornamenting the interior, but maintaining a pretty simple exterior most of the time. Whereas a lot of the Americans here were new money or they just saw the need to be a little more ostentatious with what they built. And so you got these exteriors that were a lot more elaborate and brought down some Northeastern just trends with them. So for example, across the way, we're coming around the back and side of a cluster of very American style Creole townhouses over here. And these all feature exposed brick. Now you don't get those, you get that stucco layer on most Creole style buildings because frankly, our, our bricks in Louisiana were pretty bad. So they didn't deal well with exposure to the air. And therefore, if you wanted to do this, you really needed to import brick from somewhere else. Or sometimes, not on the buildings we're looking at, but sometimes in order to get the exposed brick look, folks would paint their brick red and paint the mortar white in order to get the appearance while still sealing it shut. So you see a few buildings like that every here and there. The other two things that you'd see on these places are a plenitude of Greek revival detail, although sometimes it's hard to spot underneath all the cast iron frippery, and then really, really prominent doorways. So across the way, you can see the doors are really featured, whereas on the old Creole style houses, you can't even necessarily tell where the door is if you don't know how the buildings work. They're behind the same kinds of shutters as everything else. So that public facingness, that's very American. And sometimes behind those big ostentatious doorways was another big innovation, something Americans loved, but that Creoles weren't used to, which was hallways. Creole cottages are just four rooms arranged in a square and French colonial houses, Creole townhouses, similarly, just all the rooms connect everywhere else. So mostly what you're seeing here are houses that are a fusion of a sort of classic Creole floor plan and structure with a lot of American detailing. Slowly though, the city shifts over to much more American style tastes, bringing in a whole lot of Victorian vibe, bringing in front yards, bringing in enclosing fences, all this stuff that you'd see much more in primarily American built neighborhoods like the Garden District that are a lot less common here. And then there is the style that is 
from completely within our American period doesn't really show you much in the way of transition at all, and that is shotgun houses. And if you've heard of one kind of house from New Orleans and from maybe the South in general, this is really likely to be it. Shotguns are a classic feature of not just the French Quarter, but the entire city. And what makes them stand out is their floor plan. They were really good from the mid 19th to the mid 20th century for fitting houses into these small available lots, narrow spaces, or putting a lot of houses along a fairly short street frontage. And the way they do that is the house is just several rooms in a row with no hallway. So down here, you can see the two different kinds of them. We got on the one hand, a single shotgun over on the left and then a double shotgun next to it. A double is just basically two singles smashed together, sharing one wall in common. But either way, for someone who lives inside, a double is usually two houses. You can see the separate addresses on that side. You're just gonna have a row of rooms with no hallway. And oftentimes, maybe more often than not, the two bedrooms in the house are back to back at the back of the house. So somebody has to pass through somebody else's bedroom to get to the rest of the house. And you can maybe imagine that with two parents and nine children. So these were very low privacy ways of living. Still are, you still gotta work with it if you live in a shotgun today and there are tons of them that are inhabited now. And definitely it takes some adaptation for them to be sort of comfortable in the modern sense. You know, kitchens weren't always a part of these when they were first built, for example. Um, so they were working class houses, definitely, which I don't want to say to suggest that, like, they're necessarily super affordable now. Nothing in the French Quarter is. But if you were looking all across the city, shotgun houses embody this kind of old working class atmosphere. They're super beloved today, at least from the outside. And uh, if you were to visit during June, we have all throughout the year these various events that are about highlighting mansions and letting you get inside them and look around. But the Preservation Resource Center, which is this resource for building preservation and restoration in general all across town, does shotgun house tours during the month of June. And even if you weren't here during June, you could get out and just look around in town because these cover I'd say most of the city that had developed by the mid 20th century. And because they were around so long, they embody lots of different styles. So you can see ones like the ones across the street, which fell into the various Victorian styles that came to town. But from the early days, you can find Greek Revival shotgun houses. You can find Italianate shotgun houses from a little bit later on. And then from the kind of World War I, World War II era, you can find bungalow shotgun houses that take a Pan American style and make it a little bit more local. So they can be fun for just a house watcher to kind of find the things they have in common and then find all the ways that they're different as well. The name shotgun kind of stands out too. And oftentimes what you'd be told is that if you opened all the doors in a shotgun house, you could fire a bullet straight through and it wouldn't touch anything. That might be the reason, or it just might be that the one pair or two pairs of rooms side by side kind of make you think of a single barrel or a double barrel. Either way, the metaphor is apt. You, at the very least, whether you want to fire a bullet through somebody's house or not, you could open all the doors in some of them and see daylight from one side to the other. So we'll give it that peaceful metaphor. Anyway, as you explore town, y'all, hopefully all of this is useful in knowing what you're looking at. Most of the buildings we've talked about are specific to the French Quarter and its most historic surrounding neighborhoods. So apart from shotguns, you're not going to see these very much, except when you're exploring the French Quarter, the Marigny, Bayou St. John, neighborhoods like that but they are the fundamental vocabulary of those early days. And even in New Orleans, they help you to understand that these neighborhoods are a little different, a little deeper back into the Latin past than what you see elsewhere in the more modern parts of town. As y'all may know, Free Tours by Foot gives in-person tours around New Orleans and lots of other cities. And when we do French Quarter tours, we love to share a little bit about buildings and architecture, but we don't often get to indulge it to quite such a degree. So thank you for being along for the ride for this. And if you enjoy tipping your guides when you take these experiences, you can find the information for doing that down below. Also, we recently shared a video where we explored the inside of a classic Creole cottage. And hopefully my colleague Kayla, who got us into that one, is gonna help us explore more interiors soon. If there's particular types of houses, courtyards, etc., that you'd like to see from within, let us know and we will try and prioritize it. And if you wanna know when your idea comes to life, hit the subscribe button and it's gonna be delivered right to you. Thanks so much for watching y'all. Like the video to get it out to other people and we'll see you next time.